Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So, what I was like, what happened, and what I am like now. A lot of times we say what it was like and what happened and what it is like now. And really, what it was like and what it is like out there, it's pretty much, you know, still going on. There's a lot of, um, we're the lucky ones. We're the lucky ones. We're the ones that get to find this and come here. Um, And I, this is a family disease. And I am so grateful that we have these two programs that, um, in particular, Bill Wilson and Lois Wilson, you know, put together in the beginning um, with other people, with lots of help with other people, Dr. Bob, et cetera. Um, but it is a family disease. And to be able to be here in unity with each other and supporting each other and Al-Anon isn't for everybody, although everybody here qualifies for it in this convention because the only qualification is that you need to know an alcoholic. So there you have that. So, um, so uh, I, but I really want to support the idea of unity in the programs. And um, you've noted, you've heard the steps, and you know they, they're pretty much the same, the 12th step just says, instead of saying carrying the message to alcoholics, it says carrying the message to others. Um, Because that's the Al-Anon side of it. Which I'm curious, actually, right now. um, How many people in this room right now are here that are just here just because you're curious or whatever, but you're AA? Okay, lots. Awesome. 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 So all the other AA people there notice who those were. And all the Al-Anons, leave them alone. <laughs> okay? All the, all the people who are in Al-Anon, in, new to Al-Anon, welcome to the newcomers, Oscar and Carol and, what's your name? Joy? Welcome. Um, so all of the Al-Anons, and maybe curious to explore Al-Anon, raise your hand. And all the other Al-Anons that have been around for a while, notice those hands up. Notice those hands up. Okay, those are your people, all right? Those are the ones, all right? I mean, you can talk to each other. I'm not saying you can't talk to each other, all right? But, you, know, you know what I'm saying. So, um, So what I was like. I grew up in a really pretty happy family in a lot of ways. Um, I'm the youngest of four girls. My poor dad, four girls, can you imagine? Um, and uh, we had a lot of fun. We, my dad was kind of the fun guy in the family, and, and he would take us on, you know, every summer on car trips back to the east. I lived in, De- I was born in Denver, so we'd, we'd go from Denver every summer back to the east coast where all the relatives were. Car trips and camping trips all around Colorado and in New Mexico and, you know, just really fun stuff. He was, he was the arranger of fun. And he was also, um, uh, he was also a, uh, a preacher, a minister. So here we were four little preachers girls and we were raised in all this kind of fun and chaos of giggly girls and screaming and yelling in the house and girls, girls settled down. This will only end in tears. That was, We'd be like, ah, daddy, ah, mommy, no, and and we'd crash into each other and burst into tears. So, you know, they were usually right about that. Um, But there was also, of course, mind your manners, sit up straight, be good girls, remember who your father is in this community. Um, So we went to church every Sunday Went to, you know, as we grew older, church choir, youth group, all that kind of stuff, summer camp, church camp, all that kind of stuff, but in a fairly liberal um, denomination. Um, 
my dad was the helper. He was the, he was the, he, and he was a workaholic. He worked really hard. He, you know, I don't know, people think that preachers preach on Sunday and that that's maybe all they do, but, you know, he's visiting people in hospitals. He's counseling people throughout the week. He's, you know, working with the committees at the church. He's doing the youth group. He's, you know, being a counselor at summer camp. I mean, he just was go, go, going all the time. And um, my mom worked her tail off in the house with four girls and keeping everything looking good, right? A um, lot of pressure, a lot of, you know, the preacher's family. So um, they came from uh, what I suspect was alcoholism. And the reason I say I suspect is because we didn't talk about it. It's a shh, right? Um, my mom, my mom's parents, my grand, grandpa and nana, what we called them, um, came from Scotland. He came first and he made enough money to bring my grandmother over from Scotland. But the condition, she had the condition that she would only come if there was no drinking in the house. She would not tolerate any drinking in the house. Her father, um, I heard from my aunts, I never, you know, I kind of sort of heard from my aunts that her father, my great grandfather was an alcoholic and abusive. But again, that's that era and they just didn't talk about it. So she comes over, he sends for her, she comes over and, um, and there's no drinking in the house. Um, but he was a rager, apparently. And again, this is sort of like what I heard from my aunts, not my mom. She would never tell us anything about it because that's just not done. So um, uh, it was all just sort of stories. And my memory of him was just that I would sit on his lap and try to understand what he was saying because he had such a heavy Scottish brogue. I really couldn't understand a word he was saying. And my grandmother, we would cook, we'd make scones together and she was teeny and the, and my grandfather was a carpenter. So her kitchen counters were, you know, low. And it was just really, we had, we had good times, but my mom and her three sisters, so she's one of four girls too, raised to when dad came home from work, shh, just be, settle down girls, be quiet, don't make any noise, don't upset your father, and tiptoeing around. Um, my aunts also reported that my mom was always a um, pretty emotional, they called her bubbles because she cried a lot. And um, I actually suspect, again, that my mom really, as kind of life went on and things got complicated, that she was probably, you know, she probably had some depression and probably needed some help. But, no, not going to do that because remember who my father is in the community. People couldn't find out. That would be bad. So, shh, right? Don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody. Don't share it outside the house. Um kind of push it under the carpet. Um, so my parents both worked really, really hard, and I would say that my dad was the, uh, the uh, workaholic. And as time went on, um, and we grew up to be teenagers, we moved from Denver to the Seattle area, and we moved into a really, um, my dad got a church in a really conservative community, and... Um, and it was the 60s. It was the 1960s. So things were starting to really change in America in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it was assassinations of, you know, John Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, um, protests at the schools for the Vietnam War. Students were getting shot for protesting um, over the Vietnam War. Civil rights was happening. Churches were being bombed in the South. I mean, just, um, it was a really tumultuous time. And um, the country was becoming very divided. Hmm. Um, so my dad, this was a pretty liberal, well, a liberal denomination, Protestant congregational. And he was a social activist. So he would actually speak out in the pulpit about things like, you know, thou shalt not kill, 
so maybe we should not be in the Vietnam War. So he would, you know, um, we're all God's children in his eyes, no matter, you know, what color, what, you know, so civil rights and all of that. And he started getting threatening phone calls in the middle of the night, and uh, we were being, I guess, watched by the FBI. And, and so it was really tense times at home. And my mom, Bubbles, right, she was... <laughs> She was, you know, she was having trouble with it all. She was, um, she was raised to just be quiet and behave yourself and be good. And, and this was all too, I think, you know, just a little too much for my mom. And she got sadder and sadder. And my parents both started drinking more and more. Um, by now I'm a teenager and they're having gatherings in their home late into the night with lots of drinking and lots of, you know, heated conversations with friends about what's going on in the world. And um, by now my sisters have all gone off to college, so I'm home alone with my parents, and this is all this tumultuous stuff, and I'm coming of age. I'm, you know, a teenage girl. So um, then what happened was my mom got so sad she just, you know, couldn't stand being home alone anymore all the time, and so she went back to work. And so then I was really alone a lot. And um, there was some good stuff about that. I had a lot of fun, right? Um, it was the hippies, you know, were happening and um, rock festivals and, and marches, and I was doing all of those things. And um, uh, But along with all of that, um, I had, you know, my first love, and we got pregnant, and Remember who your father is in this community. Do not tell anybody. So they, um, so they sent me to Japan to take care of the problem because we were being watched, and it's just complicated. They didn't. I don't remember them ever asking me what I wanted to do. They just sent me to Japan by myself for the first time ever on an airplane to Tokyo, <laughs> and. Um, so that was really scary, and I felt very alone. And everything worked out okay medically, you know, but it was my first big trauma. And then a year later, um, we were, a girlfriend and I were hanging out with some college friends that had just entered the University of Washington, and we were in our senior year. And um, we had all been together that night over on one of the islands, and we came back to the University of Washington, but we lived across the lake. and. They were the ones driving, so we said, that's okay, we'll just hitchhike home, because we were all hitchhiking back then, that's what we were doing. And we got um, picked up and um, by a gang and assaulted for three hours. So um, that was you know, trauma number two. Um, and when we escaped, oh my God, there was one angel. You know, that's all you need. That's all you need is one angel, and there was one, one guy who felt really freaked out and really bad about what was happening, and he helped us escape. And so we got to a phone booth, and I called my family, and my um, mom said, I'm, your sister's home from college. I'm going to send her to come get you. I hadn't told her exactly what had happened yet. but It was like, you know, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. So my sister came and got us, and we took my other friend home, and uh, I came into the house, and I told my parents what had happened. And um, my mom said, that's what you get for hitchhiking. And went upstairs and slammed the bedroom door and burst into tears. I could hear her crying up there. That's the last time I ever talked to her about any of that. And my dad was like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And if we go and if we report this, you're going to have to go right back to the place where you got picked up in the first place to the hus nearby hospital. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. You know, that's going to be too traumatic for you. So, you know, but it was also really, it was going to be, it would be found out. And there were people that wanted my dad gone from the community, and this would have been fodder for them. So, again, remember who your father is in this community. So he took me to the doctor the next day, made sure I was okay, and then we never talked about it again. So my parents are having these drinking parties. I'm seeing them, you know, having a good time, the liquor cabinet's there, I'm starting to try it out myself. And um, I'm thinking 
but I'm just doing what everybody else is doing. I'm a hippie. I'm graduating high school. We're going to rock festivals. We're doing other drugs. You know, I'm just doing what everybody else is doing. I told myself. And um, that went on for quite a few years. And I even had one friend who I did tell what had happened to me with um, Japan and then the, the assault. And she, you know, said, you're kind of drinking a lot, you know. But by the way, I'm a double winner, okay. I'm, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's part of my story. It's not always for all Al-Anons, and I respect that. And but this is kind of this is my story, and it, it and it goes like this, right? So I have to tell the whole thing. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm like, no, you know, I'm fine. She's you're drinking an awful lot. You're doing a lot of drugs. Are you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's okay. Let's just not talk about it. And I was told not to tell anybody. So I was feeling like I was sneaking to do that, to even talk to her about it at all. And um, so I just numbed out. What al calls all of these examples, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. So I'm going down that road, and i um feeling pretty alone, and... I uh, graduate high school, I meet a guy, and um, we start dating and we get married, and a few years later, we have my son, our son, um, beautiful human being, one of God's kids, for sure, <laughs> for sure one of God's kids, um, and we stayed together for... Uh, I think it was like eight years. Five. Year, my son was five years old when we split up, and um, I want to read just a little bit from one of our pieces of literature. There's a book called "From Survival to Recovery" in Al-Anon, and um, an excerpt from that goes like this: Growing up with adults who displayed extremes of emotion or no emotion at all left us afraid of our own feelings, confused and very angry. Without any healthy demonstration of how to handle potent emotions, some of us acted out in destructive ways. And then it goes on to say later, attention for our negative behavior cost us a fearsome price in plummeting self-esteem and soaring guilt. In our young minds, however, it seemed better than facing abandonment and horror of realizing that the adults we depended upon were absent or abusive. Alcoholism is a cunning, powerful, and baffling disease, not only for the alcoholic, but for all who associate with them. It is a progressive, multi-generational, physical, emotional, and spiritual disease with wide-ranging, often tragic effects. We who have had to cope with the problems created by an alcoholic have often tried to force solutions only to find ourselves defeated again and again. We became exhausted, angry, frustrated, and unreasonable without even knowing it. Those of us who grew up in families affected by alcoholism were particularly vulnerable to its effects. We often learned not to talk, not to trust, and not to feel. So here I am married with a five-year-old. Marriage isn't going well. I'm drinking more and more, numbing out more and more. And, uh, you know, I'm deciding it's him. He's the problem. So we get a divorce. And I did that for the next 26 years. Um, Or maybe more like 20, I guess about 20 years. And the relationships got worse, um, as they do. Another part of that excerpt from um, Survival to Recovery says... Family alcoholism also made us vulnerable to abusers outside our families when we sought to love and solace anywhere we could find it. So as I'm going down the road and not talking, not trusting, not feeling, being quiet, stuffing it, self-medicating, my alcoholism is growing, come from a long line of it, aunts and uncles died from it, you know, my dad was my drinking buddy. Um... 
If I was not drinking, I was working. If I was not working, I was drinking. Those were the two things I did. So, um, I, and I, and I accomplished, I, I accomplished a lot. I, I did a lot of different really fun things in my life. I was a artist, um, and, and doing pottery and then had a jewelry business for a while and then started a clothing company with a friend and, um, that got pretty big, and then I joined a small, when I was getting the divorce, I joined a small coffee company in Seattle that um, only had three stores at the time that got pretty darn big, if you know who I'm talking about. Um, and I got promoted and promoted and promoted in that company. It was a great education. It was really a lot of fun, um, fueled with caffeine, which was very helpful because if I wasn't working, I was drinking, right? So... Um, I got sent to Canada for a couple of years to run the Canadian market um, and loved that, just loved that. But I was getting sicker and sicker. And one night I took my um, crew up there out to dinner. We went to a Chinese restaurant, and I'm getting really sick, and I'm in this abusive relationship. And I think maybe by then, maybe by then I had, he had beaten me for the third time, and so I finally decided, yeah, you know, I guess the statistics are true that if they you know, beat you once, the next time's going to be worse, and the one after that, and, you know, I might, he might kill me. So I finally <laughs> said go. And um, so I'm with my crew, and we're out to dinner at a Chinese restaurant, and we get done with the end of the meal, and the fortune cookies come around, and everybody opens theirs, and, and I've got like 12 managers, and um, they all read their fortunes, and it's, you know, you're a good friend to those around you, you've, you know, the sun will shine on you tomorrow, the, you know, your life is going to be full of, you know, roses and happiness, and then we got to mine, and mine said, you are dishonest with yourself and others. <laughs> the, the term at the time was harsh. Everybody went, oh, harsh. Oh, no, you're not, you're not dishonest with us. You're a great boss. We love you. You know, you tell it like it is, and you help us, and you've helped us grow, and we're growing the market, and we're getting promoted. You know, we love you, and you're, you know, you're totally honest with it. We love you. And I'm like, okay, good. I'm good. I'm good. But I put that fortune in my wallet. It bugged me. And um, <laughs> for several years, it bugged me. And um, every time I'd go to the grocery store to go, you know, pay for, I'd open, and there would be, you're dishonest with yourself and others. And I'm like, they told me I wasn't. They told me I was honest with them and that everything was okay and it's all good. Um, so I uh, decided that what I really needed to do, my son was grown, he'd moved out, he was going to college, and that my life was unbalanced. There was something wrong. I just knew it, but I couldn't quite tell what it was. So I decided what I needed to do was start volunteering somewhere and get a little more balance in my life. So I got involved with a nonprofit that was just forming in, in Seattle, and um, I got on the board, and, and um, I just really fell in love with the place. It, was a, it is actually still a um, cooking school for um, homeless and disadvantaged men and women, and they, we teach them how to cook and get them jobs in the food service industry. And um, it was really small at the time, and so... I was really on fire with helping grow this thing and make it make it into a nonprofit and, and make it work. Um, and I got sober also at that time. It was March first, nineteen ninety six is my AA sobriety date. And I was on fire with this place. I could you know, I could just, I was just falling in love with it. So I left my corporate job and went on staff with this little grassroots organization. And they couldn't pay me what I was making, but they said, well, how about if you just work four days a week? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. I'll work four days a week. <laughs> Remember when I said I'm a workaholic, alcoholic, right? So now, so how's that go? I used to be a workaholic, alcoholic, and then I got sober. So now I'm just a sober workaholic, right? So four days turned into six, like that. Um, I was working there all the time because I 
was getting sober. I was working the steps. My life was changing. Things were getting better. And I could help these people. (laughs) I could show them what to do. So I designed the training programs and, you know, and we had chefs in the kitchen and, and we had life skills classes and we, you know, did all this great stuff. And, um, and we did, we did great stuff. We taught them, we taught them that they had choices and that if they would build them, you know, if they would get into a community there and create community and be with people who were committed to the same things that they were committed to, that their life would get better. Sound familiar? (laughs) Um, And that they would find their voice and that they would be able to get really powerful and really create a new life for themselves and get some principles and, you know, to a better life. (sighs) So I'm fixing them. And I'm working six days a week. And... I'm sober three years, work, 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 and I meet my future husband, my adorable, wonderful husband, Jim. Um, we had met in AA, but he, I think he just kind of watched me cry for three years, <laughs> just sobbed for three years, just, oh, my God. If it, you know, I was happy, I, I sobbed. If I was sad, I sobbed. I just cried for three years. Um, and so he... Um, we met, we met in AA, but we danced one night at a New Year's Eve dance that he was putting on with some other people. And it was a meeting and then a dance and sober and all of that. And then a few weeks later, he asked me to go on a date and where do you want to go for dinner? So this is a cooking school. And what we had was all the chefs in the city would come on Thursday. A chef would come every Thursday night and bring all the food and teach the students how to cook a four-course gourmet meal all day long and donate all the, you know, product to it and everything. And um, so I'm like, why don't you come to my work? We'll have dinner at this nonprofit. He should have known at that point that, you know, she's first practically first date and she wants me to go to her job. So... um, But his sponsor told him one time, I think when he was maybe complaining about that or something similar, well, well, Jim, you do realize that water does seek its own level. So there's that. Um, so, so we danced, you know, and we, and then, and, and then that was January, New Year's Eve, and then in February he asked me to marry him, and, and I said yes. And in September we were married. Because, you know, alcoholics, and we're Al-Anons, so there you have it. Um, So during that long courtship, (laughs) he did start to notice some stuff, right? Um, There was a time when I, uh, I think it was my birthday, and we're having a, people were having a party for me, or dinner party or something, and we're supposed to be there at a certain time, but I decided that I really needed to help one of the students get from his shelter to the VA for a doctor's appointment and get him back to his shelter. I think Jim thought I was going to get him and drop him off and leave. No. I went in with him to his appointment. This is a 30-plus-year-old guy, right? But I was going to help him. And if I didn't, he might not go, and he might not get well, and he might you know, decide to go back out to the streets, and he might... You know, All this, you know, I thought I was in charge and responsible. So we were late for the party. I I had, I mean, Jim was furious. And he said, you know, we could have given him cab fare. He could have. And I was like, cab fare? Wow. That's an amazing, how did you come up with that? It was like, just like a completely foreign thought to me. So... Then there was my son, who was um, living with a young woman. My son was in his 20s, and he's living with this woman who is um, has the paperwork to prove it. I mean, she's really mentally ill. She's on all kinds of SSI and all kinds of 
you know, and she's really sick. And he just keeps hanging in with her because he's going to help her. He's going to fix her. Where did he get that from? And I'm watching him do this, and I'm watching him get sicker and sicker and give up his life and give up going to, you know, he'd, he'd miss work because she'd come down with cancer on a Friday and she'd get well by Monday, you know, but he, he couldn't go to his weekend workshop because, you know, she was sick and he'd believe it. And it just was getting worse and worse and worse. And she was, um, always getting pills and abusing pills. And I, you know, I did not want to see that, you know, he probably was too. I just didn't, not my son, not my beautiful son. Who are moms? Who's, are there moms? Right? God, it's like one of the hardest ones, I think. It's just, we're mama bears, and I don't think it ever changes, but I just was sure he was, you know, just getting, you know, screwed over by her and that he was a saint. Um, so here's my good idea, because he's with this girl that he shouldn't be with, and they're renting a house. So I decide that I have, a, I have another good idea. <laughs> I bought him a house, and it went like this. If I buy him a house, I'll do the down payment. He can make the payments. It'll be the same as rent. The, the, in that time in Seattle, it was kind of like that. So, so he'll instead of just paying rent, he'll be he'll be getting ahead in life. And and then and then because he's getting ahead in life, he'll see that she's sick and you know that he can't be with her and and he'll leave her and his life will be great. It made perfect sense to me. I just was sure it was going to work. So, um, what it really was, was, you know, I was feeling guilty for being a bad mom. I was, you know, I'd raised him and drinking and working and felt bad. And I just had to do more. I had to do more. I had to fix him. I had to help him. So, um, pretty much right away, his house payment stopped. And he, you know, I, I'm sorry, mom, I, I couldn't go to work this week. She got sick. I'm sorry, Mom, I, I, uh, I, I don't have quite enough money because um, she was really feeling bad and down and depressed, and so I bought her a gift, and I'm a little short on the... On the and pretty soon he starts saying I'm a little short on the rent. So now I'm his landlord. Not his mom, I'm his landlord. It wasn't supposed to be like it. You're supposed to pay the mortgage, right? So it's like, well, this isn't going right. This isn't, like, you're not acting right. Oh, my God. So... By this time, um, Jim has mentioned to me, Al-Anon, <laughs> you know, he goes and, and he's got two boys and they're living with us off, often. They've got a, a mom who was um, a hopeless alcoholic. She passed away this summer. Um, she, just couldn't, she just couldn't get this thing. She tried. What do we say? She tried, she tried, she tried, and she died. Um... So the boys are living with us. They're in high school. We're raising them. Jim's going to Al-Anon meetings, and I'm work, work, working. And um, he mentions Al-Anon. And then then the payments get worse and worse. They're you know less and less. And so um, finally he mentions it again. And so there's a saying in Al-Anon. It, says, it goes, say it once. It's information. Say it twice, it's clarification. Say it again, it's manipulation. Don't do it, right? So, but he said it a second time. And um, so, I'm like, you know, maybe I better start, maybe I better start considering that. So I get to Al-Anon, and this is now um, March of 2000. So three, four years sober, and I get into Al-Anon, and I start hearing stuff that is, like, super helpful right out of the gate because I just could not figure this part out on my own. I was so consumed with shame and guilt and not good enough, and I screwed up, and, you know, all that selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed pain that is real but also, you know... I'd done a four-step, I'd done some amends, I'd done all those things, 
but I was still struggling with my relationships with other people. And so I get into Al-Anon, and I start hearing the acronyms, which were really helpful for me, like the four M's um, that we that are to not mother, manage, manipulate. This is the Al-Anon salute, right? Or martyr, poor me. You know, I've just worked so hard, and you don't understand, and you just won't pay attention, and you won't let me fix you, and oh, my God, and why won't you, right? So those are the four M's, manage, mother, manipulate, martyr. And so I talked to my sponsor, and I said, my son's not paying, you know, and I've become this landlord, and it's just like, it's just a mess. And I think there's a lot more going on there, and it's just freaking me out. And she's horrible, and she's really sick, and, you know. And so the sponsor says, okay, write it out, what you, and give him some choices, because we always have choices. Give him some choices, what, and they're your boundaries, so what are they going to be? What is it that you, you know, will say to him that you are willing to really do? Don't say something you're not willing to do. So we talked about that and talked about that. I said, okay. He, so I said, you can either move out and go rent from somebody else and have that landlord because I'm not, I don't want to be your landlord. Or you can go to the bank and take over the whole contract and mortgage payments, whichever you want to do, choose. So she said, write that out, make a date with him, go sit down with him, tell him that. Do not bring up the girlfriend. <laughs> so I sit down with him and I go over the choices and he's getting a little irritated and kind of freaked out and, well, but mom and what, but, uh, and, and I said, and well, look at, I've just had it. I don't want to be your landlord. And furthermore, I think your girlfriend, while you're at work, is actually turning tricks for money. I called his girlfriend a whore. Because I knew, you know, and I knew it was good for him. So that so did not go well. (laughs) But I left him the letter that didn't say that, that just gave the choices and said, I'm leaving. I get in the car, I'm sobbing. I'm on the phone with my sponsor. Hey, he's never going to talk to me again. She said, just, she said, stop with the crying right now. Drive home, call me when you get home. And so I did, and we, we talked. She said, you're his mom. Don't worry. He'll come back. It'll be okay. Trust in God. You did the right thing, except for opening your mouth. I told you not to do that, but oh, well. Live and learn, right? You're forgiven, you know, it'll be okay. You're his mom. So um, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I've screwed it up. I learned about the three C's in Al-Anon at that point. I didn't cause it. I can't control it, and I can't cure it. I thought I was the cause of his dysfunction. I thought I could control it. I thought I could buy my house and cure it. Brilliant idea. Um, so she said, he'll come back. Don't worry about it. He'll come back. Then I heard about that how I can contribute. There's a fourth C that gets brought up. But you can contribute. And what kind of contribution do you want to be? You want to be a good one or a bad one, right? What's the choice going to be? And I had to give that some thought of what kind of contribution so I'm working really hard practicing all the parts and pieces of el right? The steps and the meetings and the literature and the sponsor and the working with others and the, you know, all of the parts and pieces of this practice. And in both programs, I'm doing that. And um, I see finally that, oh, my God, what I was doing was I was... You know, the the word's enabling, right? I was enabling my son. But really what that was, what that meant, and I heard it in a meeting, was when I enable, what I'm really saying is you are incapable, you are a loser, you are not able. And that was not at all 
what the message I wanted to send to my son, or really anybody else, but especially him. <sighs> so I just was praying and praying and praying and just hoping and hoping and hoping that, you know, and he gets, a, they rent a house, and this better than the house that you, 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 he's mad, right? It's a better house. So I'm thinking, okay, he's not going to talk to me anymore. And then about a f- three months into it, I think, he calls me and he says he wants to get together with me. Could we talk? I think, oh, boy, he's going to really let me have it. And I go into the cafe and I'm waiting for him. And he walks in and he looks better than I've seen him looking in years. He looks, the light is on in his face. He's smiling. He doesn't have circles under his eyes. He's kind of clean. He's got this cool hat. He's, you know, and he's walking tall. I'm like, hi, you know, what's going on? And he said, Mom, I just want you to know that Leah and I, I shouldn't say her name, anyway, Leah and I are are not together anymore. He said, I moved out, and I thought things were going to get better. And what I found out was they were not getting better, they were getting worse. And I finally decided that there was nothing I could do, that I was not it. I, she needed help beyond anything I could give her, and I needed to save my own life. And we've split up, and I've moved out. That was not me. That was him and his God, right? Where I finally got it, just step out of the way. Get out of the way. We could talk about it, sunlight of the spirit, right? And don't cast a shadow between you and the other person and God. Get out of the way. So I did that. He did that. And um, his life got so much better. And... I learned about detaching, you know, the detaching with love. We talk about detach with love, not screaming and yelling, not being mean, you know, mean what you say, say what you mean, but don't say it mean. And detaching with love instead of (laughs) detaching with a hatchet, right? So, so... He's doing better. He's going on. You know, he's, his life is getting great. And um, we've got these boys at home that we're raising. And my parents are retiring, and they're going into a retirement home. I had a lot of stuff with family around that that was really difficult. I was retired. My three older sisters were not retired yet. And um, it was pretty traumatic trying to get my parents into a – my mom got Alzheimer's and um, – there was just a lot of fighting and stuff because we didn't know how to talk to each other in our family. We just did not know how to talk to each other. We could not be kind. We were very, we talked about this earlier today in the panel and stuff. We were very sarcastic, cutting, um, uh, competitive, mean-spirited, and um, it was really hurtful. It was a very hurtful time, but we moved to Mexico. And, um, and we got down here, and we found this great recovery community and AA and Alan on both. And um, hard stuff happened while we were here, too. We were building a house, and we had a neighbor that was messing with us. And, and then I got cancer, and you know, we'd given up our insurance in the States. So I had all my medical down here, and it was pretty traumatic. It was another, definitely another trauma. Um, but I had the recovery community down here to help me through it. It was just amazing and a really good medical system and really beautiful doctors and um and all of you guys, it was it was really amazing. So um, I get through that, but it was really it, for some reason they didn't give me pain medication after the surgery that I had, and so it was pretty painful and pretty traumatic that way. But overall, we had a, like a really beautiful time here, and I'm kind of just pushing that down and pushing that down. And um, then we. We're here for 10 years, and then we decided to move back to the States for a bunch of really good reasons and love Mexico and miss it terribly, but it was the right thing to do at the time. And um, finished our house, another renovation. And I had a few years to just, like, just do recovery and just chill and just live life and go to meetings and do my artwork and do all of that. 
And um, what happened was that I became aware at that point that I'd had all this trauma that I had never really, really, really dealt with. And we say in these in both programs, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a, you know, we don't have a, what do you call it? Like the market on on everything, right? We go to experts for stuff. And um, so I decided that I would go get some outside help for my trauma. And um, it was amazing because it was so helpful and so beautiful. And it just went like this with my programs. They just matched up perfectly. And what I got out of that was more freedom because that's what we get here, right? We get freedom. And I got more and more freedom. And um, so I'm a big fan, and that's what I tell my sponsees. So now, well, with the trauma therapy and all of that, I live right here right now. Um, we talked about it again a little bit earlier, and Candace spoke a little bit about it in the panel, too, about you know what we do to you know stay right here right now in the situation that's actually happening versus the thoughts that try to come in from you know the past stuff. And I get to stay right here right now. And um, so much calm and freedom in that. So um, now I just get to be in the program and sponsor people. And al has really helped me with that, too, with the boundaries. Because, again, I don't, you know, I'm not the expert. And al even, I think, a little bit more than AA is that sponsorship is really equal. There is no... And I think there's some differences between AA and al on that way that kind of have to be that way. And this is just my opinion. But when I came to AA, I was, you know, drinking a bottle of scotch at night, and I was killing myself. And it was like, you get to work now. And you're going to do the steps now. And you're going to go through the steps, and you're going to get the work done. And what? But in al it's a, almost the opposite with the same end result. But it's almost the opposite of, you know what, you're you're going to, quit managing and controlling and manipulating and martyring and all of those things. And you're going to slow down and you're just going to take it slowly and you're going to relax and you're going to let go. And we're going to just go through this slowly together. The two of us, I'm not the boss of you. I'm not your, you know, and so there's a, there's kind of a difference there. Um, and there's the saying that, that Alan on says, don't just do something, sit there. And I'm like, Really? This workaholic? Are you kidding me? So it's been very helpful. So so I work with sponsees, and, and sometimes, you know, they need to get to work, but sometimes my story is their story, their story is mine, and they need to be treated with some gentleness. And um, maybe that's more true for women than men. I don't know. I don't know. But... Uh, Alan has really helped me with that, with the boundaries. Um, uh, you know, I can't cure them, I, but I can work with them and show them what I've what I've been given. So I'm not their mother. You know, I'm not going to manage their things for them. I'm not going to want their recovery more than they want it. Sometimes in AA, I feel like I kind of do. You know, I'm just going to show you, and uh, but Alan is just a little different. So I can't want it more than you do. Um, so, what else? Um, no unsolicited advice. That's the other thing in Al Anon. No advice. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not, if you ask me, what do you, you know, this is what I'm struggling with and what do you think I should do? And do you have any suggestions for me or whatever? But I'm not going to, we don't do that in Al-Anon, so we just listen. And um, how important is it? One of the slogans. Al-Anon helped me to let live by teaching me about detachment and helping me to see that many of my problems stemmed from minding everyone's business but my own. From courage to change. But for the grace of God, I love this one in particular because I'm a preacher's kid, remember? And so my oldest sister's got my mother's maiden name for her middle name, and then the other three of us have faith, hope, and my middle name is Grace. And what I thought growing up was that was just what you said at dinner before you ate. And what I got to find out here 
is what grace really is. Um, and it has to do with gratitude and all those things. But for the grace of God, even the darkest of moments can be faced with a grateful heart. If not for the crisis itself, at least for the growth it can evoke with the help of our higher power. And that's from in all our affairs. So part of the al closing says, there's a line in it that I just love. It says, talk to each other, reason things out with someone else, but let there be no gossip or criticism of one another. Instead, let the understanding, love, and peace of the program grow in you one day at a time. And I just want to thank you guys so much for listening and being here and together with AA in unity. Um, we're the lucky ones. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.